Dr. Terry Maple is president and CEO of Zoo Atlanta. See if you can figure out how things have changed for today's zoo animals as you hear how Zoo Atlanta went from being one of the worst zoos in the nation to one of the best. Well, the Zoo Atlanta story is kind of uh, remarkable, really. Uh, it was a bottom-rung zoo, no doubt about it, one of the worst zoos in the nation. The problem was that it had been neglected for many years. There hadn't been enough resources put into the zoo. When I arrived at the zoo in 1984, it was uh, what I would characterize as a hard environment. The animals were living in prisons, in a prison-like setting. Literally hard uh, surfaces, concrete, steel, cages. They were separated from the public in ways that uh, made it seem as if they were in prison. Really, the animals hadn't done anything to deserve that. What can happen to animals living in these types of conditions? Stereotyped behavior problems. We see stereotyped behavior in zoos. Uh, usually, it's a function of deprivation, that is, the animal living uh, a not-so-natural life. And they also were generated by a very small living space. Uh, and the activities that they would normally be food-searching activities become ritualized. So you see the pacing back and forth. You can change the way animals are managed. And uh, if you do that, you won't see as many stereotype behaviors. To avoid these problems, Dr. Maple and his staff made changes that benefited the zoo animals and the zoo's visitors. We wanted to enlarge the facilities. We wanted to create environments that were on the cutting edge of change. They were truly innovative, naturalistic landscape immersion. What that means is we were trying to create environments where the animal was living in a, a habitat that looked like the, the natural habitat, it looked like a jungle or a desert, wherever the animal came from. So if the landscape immersion works, you create a continuity between the human space and the, and the animal enclosure, almost as if they're not in an enclosure at all. The animals living in those uh, environments do look very much like they're very close to you. The environments themselves resemble their native environments, and I think the animals do better in those environments, and they seem happier in those environments. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us for Leading Voices, a series that highlights the best and brightest alumni of the University of the Pacific. We are honored today to hear from one of our great alums, Dr. Terry Maple. Dr. Maple is a behavioral research scientist, wildlife conservationist, and Professor Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technology. But Dr. Maple may be best known for his 18 years as director and later president and CEO of Zoo Atlanta, where he transformed that troubled zoo into a model institution and a financially strong cultural attraction. A 1968 graduate of College of the Pacific and co-captain of our baseball team, Dr. Maple received Pacific's Distinguished Alumni Award in Public Service in 1998 and in 2008, received an honorary doctorate. Dr. Maple has authored or co-authored 12 books, including Zoo Man, an autobiography detailing the early years of his career as a zoo director. He has traveled the world and helped with negotiations with the Chinese government to ob obtain pandas. He was a key character in the book and Disney film, The One and Only Ivan, which is the true life story of a gorilla that lived in a shopping mall for almost 27 years before being moved to a sanctuary. He is currently working on a new book about saving the iconic gorilla, Willie B. Dr. Maple, welcome back to Pacific. Thank you, glad to be here. It's great, to, it's great, to, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. You know, let's, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Um, tell us a little bit, if you could, uh, you, as I understand it, you came to Pacific with the intention to become a foreign service officer and ended up working with wildlife. Tell us a little bit, and this is, uh, as you know, not unusual for many students. Tell us a little bit about that path and that transition while you were here at Pacific. Well, I kind of think people sort of find their way. Uh, they end up doing what they really were meant to do, but sometimes it's a very circuitous path. Uh, mine looks unusual at first glance, but there's a couple of things that were important in my early life. Number one, my mother loved animals. She was always, in fact, she loved crazy animals. She was always bringing home troubled animals, 
dogs that chase their tails. And you know, if the animal had a problem and somebody wanted to get rid of it, my mother wanted it. So we were always analyzing and trying to figure out how to fix this animal. It was just the nature of, of my mother. He, and she and I were very close. But it's also the case that my, my parents took me to the San Diego Zoo very, very frequently. It was my favorite place to go. We'd get the whole family, grandma and grandpa, the whole family, and go to the zoo. And it was just extraordinary. Now, I didn't know you could work in a zoo. I just never had the idea that people could get paid to do that. So I never thought about that, but I did enjoy it. And I know I was influenced by it. So years later, when I began to contemplate what it is I wanted to do, I, I saw Pacific as a road to international relations. And because I never traveled, I, my, my father didn't have money for us to go anywhere. Uh, I always wanted to travel. My mother was traveling in her mind all the time. We'd watch movies together. She loved jungle movies. But so I always wanted to travel, but I felt maybe I could figure out a way to do it. So international relations, uh, serving the government in, in, in a way um, seemed appealing to me. But on the way to this uh, feature, the Vietnam War happened and did not make me very happy, nor did it make anybody happy. Uh, it was young in those days. So we kind of fell out of love with our government. It's sort of sad because I'm a very patriotic person. And uh, all the family served in World War II. And uh, my father, uh, my, my uncle, had jumped into all the major battles in, in World War II, including Normandy. He was a paratrooper medic. He lived to be 99. So uh, I, and I grew up in San Diego. It's a very patriotic town. I'm conservative. You know, I, I am unusual in academia in that I'm a conservative and I admit it. <laughs> so it might seem peculiar that I didn't like that war very much. But I don't think anybody liked it. And uh, the fact is it, it kind of stopped me for a while. But I went back to this passion for animals when I went to graduate school at Davis after Pacific. And I, I was uh, allowed to work at the Davis Primate Center with monkeys. I was always interested in primates. So that really set me off into this direction. Uh, but what I learned very quickly was these monkeys were not living well, especially in zoos. I'd go to zoos and I did so not San Diego Zoo. This is terrible. Most zoos were, were very bad. So I decided uh, at a fairly early age that I was going to try to do something about it. If I was going to have some effect on the world, it's a very uh, big challenge to think that you could change the world for people. But if you could change the world for some animals, uh, that seemed achievable to me. That seemed like a goal that I could set. And uh, I began to work on that. And gradually, and once I was appointed a professor and you know, professors sort of figure out what it is they want to do, and they become expert at it. And I just kept climbing the ladder, and here I am. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You know, before before we leave your years at Pacific, I, I, I'd love to hear you talk just a little bit about, you know, in some ways, you know, you, you wore two uh, hats uh, when you were here. You were a, a student psychology major in the college. Uh, and you were a serious baseball player uh, on, a, on some pretty terrific teams. I'm wondering if you, reflecting back, if you can talk a bit about what you took out of each of those experiences, both the academic and the athletic experiences, uh, and, and, and how did that shape you as you move forward in life? Well, I was an all-around athlete in high school, and I had a lot of trouble with deciding which sport to play. But uh, athletic injuries played a role in that. Ultimately, I decided baseball was my best path. And I played on championship baseball teams in high school. And when I came to Pacific, I was impressed with Coach Tubbs. He wanted to win. He wanted me. He recruited me hard. And without him, I wouldn't have been able to go there. He made it possible for me to have financial aid, all kinds of financial aid. And so um, I went up to Pacific and began to try to balance this academic and, and, and baseball thing, it was not easy because my tendency was to, to be the baseball player. Right? And, and the scholarly part, you know, you got to be disciplined and you got to really, uh, I used to think you'd have to be a monk to be a professor. 
but my brother was a professor and he wasn't a monk. So I, I started thinking maybe I could do it too. And, uh, but it did look like the life that I wanted. And once I began to know that, you know, it's a funny thing. Pacific is a place where the professors really do know your name and they become your lifelong friends. These guys helped me when I was young and they helped me through my career and they're still helping me. Um, I, I have so much respect for them and Pacific chose wisely the professors who mentored us. And one of my uh, most wonderful professors, although I never studied under him, but he certainly influenced me was Larry Meredith. Now Larry, conducted our wedding ceremony in Morris Tra Chapel when my wife and I got married. Uh, so, uh, and we always see each other. Whenever I come out there, we go to dinner. The wonderful guy, he's gonna live forever. So uh, I, I learned a lot from these people. I managed to balance it. And with time, uh, the scholarship began to take over because my baseball, I was a good player. I was one of the better players in the day, but I wasn't the best. And I had a few, uh, stumbles that uh, kept me from getting a pro contract. So as a result, I had to say goodbye to baseball and I said hello to graduate school. And my dear wife, who has helped me for 49 years, um, so I think I made the right choices. Pacific gave me the options. Wonderful. Do, do you have, a, do you have a, a favorite place on our campus? Uh, there's so many, so many beautiful, iconic buildings and spaces. Is there, is there one that really uh, sticks out for you? Well, I love Morris Chapel. That's, that's, that's the right that's answer I mean. for your wife. <laughs> you know, when she was walking down the aisle, there was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Um, I love Billy Hibbert Field. We played in a Class A baseball field. It was unusual in those days. Unfortunately, uh, uh, they sold it or stopped playing there. And they, but I'm glad they built their own campus um, uh, field. That's, that's what you have to have these days. But, but we were lucky to play at Hebert Field. And when we came back for the reunion, we made sure we went out there, and said hello to it. Because <laughs> it's where we did some wonderful things. But I liked Stockton. I, I really did. I, I, I liked uh, meeting people from different parts of the state. I was from Southern California. And these Northern Californians were a little bit different than the people I had met in San Diego and LA. Uh, but I enjoyed it. I made a lot of good friends. It's a beautiful campus. Uh, when I first went up there and saw the ivy covered walls, I said, man, this is, this is something else. So uh, from the very beginning, it was kind of a love affair. I also love the stag statues and uh, I've been telling my friends in the athletic department, and I know you make a big deal out of stag, but it's not big enough. Stag is, is huge. Uh, we had an icon at uh, Georgia Tech named Bobby Dodd, and they, uh, they have really, really built him up, and, and I hope uh, they'll continue to build up stag's reputation. And his, uh, because Pacific is a place where you really can be a leader. You can learn how to be a leader. I know the baseball program really wants to produce leaders. And uh, the stag history was a very important uh, part of, of national history. And uh, of course, you've had Rubeck and other things. A lot of remarkable people have gone to Pacific. It's a wonderful college. And uh, it's very dear to me. And you, I, I will have to send you a picture because uh, before uh, during the preseason, uh, we had a little trouble one day over at Klein Field. So uh, Coach Rodriguez packed up the team and went over to uh, Hebert Field, and they uh, and they played a scrimmage there. I have a picture of it. I'll send it to you. You'll get a you'll get a. Well, I'll be darn. Well, it's yeah. a pretty good ballpark. <laughs> and and it, it was very, and the field is still in great shape. The stands not so much, but the fields and the fields in yep. great shape. <laughs> yep. So, Dr. Maple, you know you you've traveled the world. You've had so many fascinating experiences uh, as, you're, as you're intersecting on all of your different projects and, and, and working with animals. Is there any one story, any one instance that really stands out in your mind um, um, as, you're, as you're traveling the world with a, with, particular, with a particular animal, a particular anecdote that you wanted to maybe share with us? 
Well, my first trip to Africa was pretty extraordinary because uh, I went to see a former student who had worked with me at the California Primates, Bruce Westland, and he was now at UCR. And he it was uh, following baboons in the Kumi Park in Tanzania. And he wrote me and he said, with well, area, uh, I learned a lot about baboons from you, but do you not understand baboons until you come to the field? You need to see them in the wild. So with that invitation, I arranged to uh, go there. And oddly, it was rather a confusing time because I was beginning to get influence at the National Institutes of Health. And just as I was preparing to go into Africa, I got a letter from a guy named Ben Blood in Washington. He said, we want you to be on the very first evaluation committee for a primate peace socialization project for chimps. These are medical chimps that are being retrained to be, quote, normal. Well, this was right up my alley, and I certainly wanted to do that. But I had to cut short my Africa trip. So I made the compromise. But I was in Africa long enough to stomp around with Bruce and all the baboons, get a terrible sunburn. And uh, the highlight of which was going to Jane Goodall's house. At that time, she lived uh, right next to Julius and Yeri, the president of Tanzania on the Indian Ocean. She was married to Derek Bryson, who was the expatriate uh, director of the park system in Tanzania. So he sat there in her garden with me and Bruce, and we had tea with the great Jane Goodall. And I'll always remember, I told her, I said, well, I'm sorry I can't stay longer, but I'm going back for this big meeting on chimp resocialization. And she being the great expert on chimp, she said to me, I'll never forget this. I couldn't imagine the American government would ever be that smart. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they were. I went back and we chose a wonderful facility in Texas run by a guy who became a great friend of mine, Mike Keeling, one of my top graduate students. So uh, eventually went to work there. But the chimpanzee thing has been a real revolution. And uh, But I think the other thing that I remember a lot about Africa was the gorilla uh, trips I took. Anytime you can sit about 10 feet from a male silverback gorilla and the gorilla just tolerates you, the little ones want to take your camera, uh, but you got to be quiet and be, be careful not to, not to play with them. It's extraordinary. It was really the most remarkable thing I've ever experienced. Dr. Maple, let us take you back to Zoo Atlanta. So you, you took over an operation that um, I mean, let's be like, let's be honest. It was, it was a disaster pretty much on every, on every dimension. And you have turned that around in an extraordinary way. Can you tell us a little bit in those early years, what your approach was? And maybe in telling that you can tell us a little bit about your leadership style and how you were so successful in being able to move the, the institution so quickly on such a, on such a sharp, positive trajectory. Well, I thought about it a lot and uh, written about it a lot, but, but um, the truth is that when I, when I was put into the situation, it was frightening. Uh, I was a college professor having, the, having a ball, being free and you know, having academic freedom. And all of a sudden I had a board, I had a city government, I had a dysfunctional organization, employees who hated me because they didn't trust me. And uh, you'd think that I would have failed, but I'm, I've got the underdog personality. I always have. When I was playing ball, you know, you tell me we can't beat those guys, I would find a way to beat them. And I just never accepted the fact that I was <laughs> limited. So uh, that was my major uh, tool was to say to people, Look, we can do this, we can do it. And we just had to figure out how to do it. I had an assistant who had a lot of city experience. And I told her one day, said, look, Susan, I'm never going to understand city government. And I don't want to understand city government. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. But you understand. It. I want you to find the opportunities that we can use to change this place. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. I'm going to tell you what I want to do. And I want you to find the solution. And she did. She kept going back to the archives and figuring it out. 
One day we had to hire a gear eater. Now we had an old gear eater, he retired. The rule said that, I used to exaggerate this, but it's, it's not the true number, but I like using the exaggerating number. The guy had 37 years of leave time, probably more like 37 weeks, but he was gonna be there way longer than I wanted him to be there after he quit. And I couldn't replace him. So um, she went to the, to the rules and found out all I had to do is get Mayor Young, who I greatly admire, you know, he's the great civil rights leader, and I got to work for him. Um, Mayor Young just had to agree that, that this was an emergency. And if he declared it an emergency, I could hire anybody I wanted. So he agreed to do that. I turned around and hired this very bright young guy who came in, made a huge difference from the very beginning he arrived. And that's when we began to turn it around. We began to get personnel who were experienced, who cared, who come out of winning institutions. That's another thing I learned from sports. I've always told the coaches whenever they came around to talk to me that my philosophy of recruitment is simply this. Don't look at his batting average. Is he a winner? If he has a history of winning, if he's played on winning teams, if he's been the guy that's come through in the clutch, maybe his batting average is 240. But he's a clutch player. He's not intimidated or afraid. That's the player you want. And if you can build a team like that of people who, who are winners, then they're going to be winners in college, too, and beyond. And they're going to be winners in life. I strongly believe that. So. We took that approach, and, and I was fortunate to be able to recruit not only great employees, but great students who came to work with us. We were in such a unique situation. Yeah, it was a disaster, but it was also with tabula rasa. I'm the only guy, only professor probably in the history of the world that ever was handed an institution and said, change it and study it. And I did. I, we wrote paper after paper after paper. We researched what we did. That's what makes it the most document, uh, documented uh, change situation that I know of. Uh, so that, that was really it. It, it, was, uh, it, was, it was scary. There were moments when I wanted to quit. But I remember my wife, when I took the job, she said, Terry, you can't make it any worse. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a compliment. <laughs> I was dumb enough to take the job, and really, it's made all the difference in my life. That's 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 wonderful. Well, congratulations on 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 that. Really, a truly re remarkable turnaround. You know, Dr. Maple, you, you've used baseball analogies a few times and, and talking about putting together your team. I often think about in um, uh, in in other institutions, uh, thinking about it as a baseball team, uh, as you would develop a baseball team, because you want a right, you want a great uh, power hitting first baseman, but you don't want nine of them, right? You want yeah. You want a you know a fast you know center fielder and shortstop, but you don't want nine of them. So it's I I I, uh, I think your baseball analogies are um, uh, there's a lot of leadership lessons in there uh, for all of us. I believe. Well, I played with a bunch of great guys. And, uh, I was a first base. You know, Coach Tufts called me when I was in San Diego and said, "Have you ever played first base?" And I said, "Well, when I was in the fifth grade, I think I played first base. I've been playing in infield for quite a while." Uh, but he said, I want you to come up and play first base. So I went out to the first day of practice and all these guys, three huge guys. I, I'm 5'10". These guys were gigantic. Keith Swaggerty was out there trying to be a first baseman. So when I saw him, I said, holy moly. You know? But I was better than they were. And I was quicker and I had all the tools. Uh, and they were, they were big, but they weren't as good. So I was um, selected to play in the start and learned how to play the first base position, found out it was the third most active position on the field. And Tom used his first baseman uh, in all the cutoff positions. So I was um, even more active. And um, uh, it, it was fun to be that close to the action. The pitchers and the catchers, we had great pitch. That's what made our team who we were, especially in 68. We had great pitchers. John Strohmeyer was, he was a fabulous pitcher and a fabulous guy. He just passed recently, we, we miss him. He was my co-captain. 
Um, so Dr. Maple, let us, we have so many alumni and, um, and students and some friends who, who want to, uh, who want to uh, ask you some questions and, uh, and say hello. So with that, let me turn it back over to Christopher and we can, uh, we can do some Q and A. Christopher. All right, thank you so much. So for everyone who is on here today, if you use the raise hand function uh, under the participants uh, button, you'll see a raise hand function. Um, and we have a couple of people already up there. So we'll go ahead and call on those. Um, and the first is Diane Philibosian. So if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, we will add you, let you hear. Hi, Terry, how are you doing? Good to see Hi, you. Hi, Diane, how are you? Uh, thank you again for the wonderful time that we had at the Zoo Atlanta together. Um, I really enjoyed all the behind the scenes observations of everything um, and spent many, many days and hours at Zoo Atlanta during our time there. Um, but I wanted to ask you how you built your board. I know one of our uh, Pacific alums, Steve Hughes, I think was on your board. And right. uh, how did you go about building that board with that disaster that you inherited? Well, I didn't have much to do with the early board, uh, but my uh, one of my mentors, Carolyn Boyd Hatcher, a uh, brilliant woman, she uh, put together the board and it was, it was a wonderful uh, uh, achievement because it was a, a gender balanced board way back in 1984. Um, and it was racially balanced between African-Americans and white folks. Uh, that's the division that had been in the city for a long time. But the Zoological Society who, who wanted to take over the zoo, they were lily white. So Carolyn brought in and, and worked with the mayor to make sure that this was gonna bring the whole community together. So I was able to begin my, my work there uh, under those conditions. Um, with time, I had more input into who the board members, especially the chairs. I was pretty influential in who became chair. Uh, when it came to Steve, though, you know, I, Steve was in town. Uh, he called me. I knew he was working in Atlanta. We're good friends. We were fraternity brothers, in fact. And I said, well, hey, why don't you come join our board? And he did. He was been a very good board member. So, uh, but everybody wanted to be on that board. I mean, it wasn't hard to build it up because it was a very influential, a very visible uh, and we were getting the job done. I mean, uh, Mayor Young called it the most important privatization in the entire state. And um, we were changing the way a zoo is run. The model we picked was new. And every zoo in the country wanted to be like us. You know, we went from being a pariah to being the model. So that was a pretty extraordinary thing. And the board deserves enormous credit for that. Thing about a board, and I'm sure you you understand this. Yeah, I used to think the board could be your friend, uh, and I had some people on there that I thought were my friends. But all you have to do is have a bad year, and then you find out who your friends really are. They're, they're not there to be your friends. They're there to guide you and help urge you to, you know, do the right things. And so I learned over time. I remember Bob Betty, who was probably the closest thing to a friend. Uh, when he became German, he, he took me to this fancy restaurant. And the first thing he said to me, well, Terry, we're going to have to do some re-engineering. I said, Bob, we're going to downsize. That's what you want to do. He said, no, right size, Terry. We're going to right size. <laughs> and his idea was we had a little fat, a little flab. And, and then he convinced me that I could find it. And I didn't want to do it. Uh, we had the right team. But he said, Terry, uh, there's nothing more important in the life of the corporation. Not you, not me, no one here is the corporation. If we cannot make it solvent, then we'll never succeed. And that was our battle the whole time because we were so underfunded. But by the time I left there, the zoo had raised millions and millions of dollars and had reached donors it had never seen before. People like Arthur Blank, Bernie Marcus, and Ted Turner. They were all giving to the zoo and they had never given to the zoo before. Well, thank you for all your marvelous work there. 
Well, uh, it was a pleasure. It really was. All right. Next up, we have Dave Fredrickson. If you want to unmute yourself? Well, oh, there I am. Hi, Terry. Hi, Dave. You're a famous. How are you? Doing? Uh <laughs> You're one of my famous uh, graduates. I always see you. Uh, at the activities and uh, you've done a lot for the university and on behalf of all of us who graduated there, I think. Well, I, uh, I, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you about uh, an experience that you had when you came back and spent a week with us in the Jacoby Center on the Citizen Leader Program. And uh, you spent a lot of time in and out of class with students and staff and faculty. And it hasn't been that long ago. And I just wanted to get a kind of a sense of how you saw the difference between today's students and our generation of students. Well, that's a complicated question. Uh, and I'm not- I know. <laughs> I'm not entirely happy with uh, today's students. Uh, I wasn't entirely happy with our students, but here's the difference. I was out of a generation that wanted to make a difference, that wanted to do things, to make things better. I worked down in South Stockton with the so-called underprivileged kids, worked for a guy named George Moten. I loved it. Um, and uh, we got a lot done. I mentored him, I coached him. Uh, it was always uh, an ambition trying to help people, help young people. But what I didn't like was when the civil rights movement started to turn violent. And, um, you know, there's just recently an article about Stokely Garmichael. Uh, I think it was in the Phi Beta Kappa newsletter, the first time he uttered the words black power. And I got no problem with black power, but uh, depending on what it means, um, I am a strong advocate of Martin Luther King's view uh, that um, uh, you don't judge somebody by their skin. And a lot of our young people are judging white people uh, by their skin. And that's wrong. It's as wrong as the other way. And uh, I think they need to be mentored by our faculties and by our, uh, uh, the older folks that are around them. And we're, we're not doing it. I see the faculties uh, allowing the students to run free and wild, allowing organizations to hit the decks with the anarchy. Uh, and I think it has to be uh, more strongly controlled. Now, that's easy for me to say, but um, just from afar, and I've been on the academy for my whole career, presidents, boards of directors, governments, and faculty have got to get together and say, what are our standards going to be? And I'm quite sure those discussions are probably taking place now, but it doesn't look like it when these campuses erupt the way they do. It looks like true anarchy. So that concerns me. I think the, the students today are not well led and sometimes they make poor decisions. Well, maybe that's true of all young people. <laughs> But these young people, when you make poor decisions and they have a, a gun at the end of it, that's, that's a really bad decision. So that, that's why for me, it's a complicated question. I, I would like to say, uh, now I didn't see that at Pacific. I mean, I didn't see the anarchists running around at Pacific. I was impressed with the young people. They were very much like us. And uh, if I were gonna teach uh, at another school, that's the kind of school I'd wanna teach. But in many, many other schools, including the University of California, it's not like that. We got a problem in this country. Thank you so much. All right, so I have a question from our chat um, that was submitted. And this one goes back to your time at the zoo. Uh, what, what accomplishment as zoo director are you most proud of? <laughs> Well, I'm uh, writing a book about it right now. I just finished the manuscript uh, of a book about the iconic gorilla, Willie B. In fact, the title of the book is Atlanta's Iconic Ape, 
The Willie B uh, was the, the animal we liberated from a life uh, like Ivan in a cage. And uh, he surprised everybody. And after all those years of isolation and not seeing another gorilla for 28 years, he bred five times. He got along with females really well. And he is the greatest success of any gorilla <laughs> has ever lived. So the story is also an allegory or a metaphor, I guess, for the city, the city's growth and recovery, the zoo itself. And in a way, it's my story. So I decided it was time to write that book. Nobody had ever written a book about it. So that book will be out soon. And uh, it's a fascinating story, I think, about how we turned his life around. And it was, I mean, I'm telling you, it was a team effort all the way. The entire city, thousands of people participated in his liberation. And he's, he lived as good as any gorilla in the zoo had ever lived. So uh, that's, that's a story that is worth telling. Wonderful. We have one more question from the chat, and then we will call on Gene Bigler after that. How was your career in psychobiology shaped or influenced your writing, or vice versa? Has your writing influenced your career in psychobiology? Well, it's, it's been a key to my success. I, you know, when I started college, uh, my teachers always told me, you know, Terry, you're, you're a very creative writer. You have insight and you have good ideas, but, but you're kind of sloppy. <laughs> you're not disciplined enough and you got to learn how to do that. So I did, I went, I kept practicing and you know, but to be a writer, you got to write. And I had the opportunity to do it because when I went into the academy, I was in a public or parish situation. I wasn't at a teaching university. Davis was a research university. So my future was going to be how many publications could I get out? And my mentor made me write. So all my teachers, the ones that made a difference, like Martin Gibson, Pacific, uh, helped me to learn how to write better. So it was just with practice, time, and mentoring, I became a better writer. I think right now I'm writing my best stuff. And it's easy uh, when I write a book, uh, it just flows. But, but I, I've learned about myself. Uh, I beat myself up because I think I'm procrastinating, but I'm not. I'm figuring it out. <laughs> I actually have to think through everything I write until I'm ready to write. And if I isn't ready to write, I can't do it. It's weird. I just came to uh, appreciate this late in life because I, I'd rather suffer in the old days because I didn't get that paper out. Uh, but um, I was very productive and uh, I became pretty good at it. And I tried to help all my students. And of course, they, they came out of school better writers than I was. And they had better training. Now, I did study journalism in high school. Journalism, I think, helped me a great deal in learning how to write. So, uh, but I enjoy writing. I have uh, this wonderful little office here at home. I've always had a home office. And uh, one thing that, that's unique about my life right now, since I retired three times, uh, I'm supported by a benefactor in Denver, Colorado. No, sorry, not Denver, uh, in, in uh, uh, Colorado. She uh, is, a, is a philanthropist who discovered me and discovered my work. She supports a lot of scientists, conservationists around the world. And so she uh, helps me to keep my head straight and keep my productivity going because she values what I write. And I appreciate so much what she's done for me to keep me in the game. So here I am, uh, 74 years old, and I'm writing as much as I ever did. Thanks to her. <laughs> you you got to have a grant, but you're going to keep going. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. And for everyone else, uh, if you do have a question, please do raise your hand using the participants tab. And with that, we will call on Gene Bigler if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, <clears throat> hello, Terry. Uh, can, am I unmuted now? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's good to hear you um, 
see a, a classmate um, that has uh, contributed so much to the university and, and society. And uh, I wanted to turn away from um, the course of the conversation a little bit to um, the emphasis that you just put on your role as a scientist. Um, and because that's an area in which you made a, uh, an important contribution um, in the debate about environmental responsibility and the role of science in, in leading us um, to uh, uh, protection and in, in intelligent use of, of the environment. Um, and I, I was just wondering, it, it seems to me as though since that, since you wrote that book, um, we've actually gone backwards um, and we've, we've had really difficulty um, in, uh, in the role of science in providing leadership uh, uh, in dealing with the pandemic and in dealing with global warming and in a number of areas. And, and I wonder if, if you, you would comment on um, your experience and, and how we can um, reverse the situation and get back to the situation in which we, um, we, we follow science more closely um, in the orientation of public policy? Well, it's a good question, Jane. Uh, by the way, I knew Jane when we were both young bucks. I always had tremendous admiration for him, uh, particularly his facility with the Spanish language. I have Hispanic genes, and I'm, but I can't speak a lick of Spanish. <laughs> so I admire that in him. You know, my grandchildren are learning Spanish. They're in a bilingual school. All four of them can speak terrific Spanish. Really happy my daughter saw that. Uh, but getting to your question, um, uh, there's uh, uh, no doubt we have a problem. Now, you, the book you're referring to is the book I wrote with Gingrich uh, called Contract with the Earth. Now, in that book, uh, people were surprised that he came off so strongly in favor of the environment they thought of him as a, you know, a raging conservative, but in fact, he's got a soft spot when it comes to wildlife and conservation. And, uh, you know, the truth, uh, I know that he would agree, but I could say this, they do it all the time. I wrote that book. He didn't write the book, but his name was first. I remember when the marketing guys told me, um, I said, look, how come his name is so much bigger than mine? And the, and the guy said, Gary, do you want to sell these books or do you want to? <laughs> okay. That is it. It's Newt's book, and everybody understands that. It got great reviews in the New York Times and other places. His base didn't like it. They weren't ready to be drug uh, kicking and screaming into the environmental world. Now, Newt used to say, I didn't leave the environment, it left me. And uh, the truth is there were a lot of conservatives in the early days who were involved in the environmental movement. And you remember Richard Nixon's the Endangered Species Act. So not that he was enthusiastic about it, but he did it. And um, being a conservative, and I know you were a conservative at one time. I know that because I remember, I have a good memory, Jane, with this thing. But um, I never thought I could not be a conservative and still be devoted to science. And um, Newt convinced me that I, that I could talk to conservatives. They trusted me enough that I could make some progress for them. Uh, now, I'm, you know, the liberals are where the liberals are. I, I don't need to work with them. But the conservatives need a lot of help. And I've been trying uh, bits and pieces to move them along. Uh, at times, they've been there, and at times, they haven't been there. I'm disappointed with where they are right now, there's no doubt about it, but Gingrich is not in a leadership position anymore, so he can't help him, but he did help me. My brother, Brian, who you know is a physicist, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, he put me on a committee at academies. I served six years on that committee, and I was able to uh, work with a lot of brilliant uh, people uh, on these political issues, because, uh, you know, the the administration that came in with Trump, it wasn't just they hated Trump, Trump hated them. I mean, the hate went both ways. And I used to tell them, I said, you can't have a government so alienated from the scientific community. Somebody's got to bridge the gap. But uh, I was only able to make small progress here and there 
uh, Newt gave a talk there. They were very well received. He, he tried to influence the, the uh, administration, uh, but it, it, it just didn't uh, get traction. So I'd still, a, a, uh, let's call it a, a lifelong ambition uh, because I do have some political interests um, to try to help to bring people together. Uh, as one of my friends used to say, build bridges and fences. How can we build? And in the book, you, you'll see what Newton and I said, we want a bipartisan uh, movement on the environment. He very strongly stated that. And uh, if it's not bipartisan, if you don't find common ground, it's not going to work. So it's frustrating, Gene. I know how you feel about it. Uh, but you just do what you can do. I have a friend I argue politics with all the time. But and I say, look, I don't go there. I don't get up there and call people Nazis or you know, fight those battles. I just fight the battles I can fight. I work on the things that I, I can work. I try to make a difference in the areas where I can. If you don't get too ambitious about what you want to do, you can usually get some results. Thanks, right. Thank you. It's really Thank good you. to see you so much. All right, so we have one last question. Uh, Mary Piatanza, if, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm a native San Diegan. I still live here, have my annual memberships to the zoo and Safari Park, formerly known as San Diego Wild Animal Park, and um, have been to Africa and been on safari in Africa and have this amazing appreciation for animals, as you've articulated. When you went to um, the Atlanta Zoo, what was the goal that you had set out to accomplish? And when did you know you had achieved that goal? And what did that feel like? Well, there were a number of uh, goals, really, but um, if I want to boil it down to one simple thing. Uh, I wanted to bring the zoo to a level of respectability among world zoos, because as I say, it had become a pariah. And my dream from day one, because I really didn't want that job. <laughs> I was the only guy who would take that job. And I was at that time the least experienced zoo director in the nation. But I took it as a matter of duty. I had a friend who called me, he said, why are you getting in bed with those thieves? And I said, if it happened in your community, you'd do it too. I wanted to help. Mm -hmm. well, my principal dream was simply this. I dreamed of the day when a real zoo director would show up and accept one of the best jobs available. And that happened. That happened. I was able to hand it off to a guy who, who was a wonderful director, had excellent credentials. And when they searched for him, they told me, they said, Gary, we're not going to change your values. We're going to pick somebody with more business training, but we're going to keep the values you established here. We believe in it. And they did. The board acted wisely. It was a great choice. And it was one of the happiest days of my life. What did that feel like? Like, oh my gosh, you sat down, you looked in the mirror. I can't believe I did this. What did that feel like? It's over. <laughs> <laughs> My nightmare is over. Now, nobody understands uh, how hard it is to have two demanding jobs. Because I never stopped working in the academy. Uh, I was I was clearly one of the most productive professors on the campus. And I published hundreds of articles. My students, I produced brilliant students. Most of, most of them women, though. So I was uh, very good at what I did there and I had to work at it, but I couldn't work at it full time. So I was always balancing. Somehow I was able to do it. Well, thank you. That work is an inspiration. Thanks for sharing. I want to tell you, I keep dabbing my face. It's spring here in the in the Fernandina Beach and those allergies are starting to attack. <laughs> Well, Dr. Maple, I, I have to tell you, this was an absolute treat to be able to chat with you this afternoon. We're so appreciative of your time.
and all you've done for Pacific. Um, and thanks to everybody who, uh, who took time out of their schedules to join us today. We're very appreciative of you. Uh, if we can wrap up with just um, one simple question, it may not be a simple answer, but one simple question. A as you know, uh, University of the Pacific, we're headed into the final stretch of our Leading with Purpose campaign. Uh, and these days we think it's more important than ever to think about what our purpose is. So if I can ask you simply, what is your purpose? Well, my purpose was always to lead a well-balanced life. And if I could influence the way young people were educated, I would hope for them to have the same experience of developing a well-balanced life. That means devoted to family, devoted to friends, devoted to community, scholarship, athletics if it's in their blood, and whatever their religion is. Um, we need people like, we can't throw any of those away. They're all important. And I think Pacific is the kind of a place that allows people to think that way. And I'll tell you the very simple story about how I got on that road. I was troubled by the theory of evolution. I went to my physics professor and I asked him, is it possible to be uh, a Christian and to believe in the theory of evolution? And his answer was, yes, I'm one who does. <laughs> I'm the guy. <laughs> so boy, did that make me feel better. Uh, and uh, just knowing that a lot of things were possible that I thought may not be possible. Uh, I had to dream big uh, to be successful in life because I had humble beginnings. Uh, and I fulfilled those dreams because I went to a college that cared about my dreams and helped nurture them along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maple. And, and as, we, as we wrap up, I will, I will simply say you mentioned uh, before Professor Meredith, who played such an influential role in your life. Uh, Dr. Meredith is with us today, as he often is for these, which we're so appreciative. We think uh, Larry really embodies um, what it means to be a University of the Pacific professor. So, he really does. Dr. Meredith, thank you for being with us today. Dr. Maple, thank you so much. And to all of you, thank you for being here. A wonderful, uh, a wonderful hour, a wonderful way to spend an hour. Um, thank you so much and go Tigers. <laughs>